All right, cool. All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's program, uh, Hooked on Ocean Acidification. I'm Doug Zemeckis. I work with Rutgers Cooperative Extension based in Thomas River, New Jersey. I'll be the facilitator for tonight's program. Tonight's night number two of four of this mini uh, webinar series. Uh, we met last week on Thursday, February 18th, and we have two more after this evening in early March as part of this four-part mini series on ocean acidification. We're scheduled tonight for 6.30 to 8 p.m. And this mini series is uh, intended to provide um, recreate stakeholders of our mid-Atlantic recreational fisheries and other interested stakeholders on the latest research related to ocean acidification and how it may impact our um, recreational marine fisheries in the mid-Atlantic region and what could be done to potentially reduce these impacts on our marine environment uh, fish, uh, fin and shellfish and our marine ecosystems. Uh, this program is sponsored by MACAN, the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Acidification Network, and MARACUS. We love our acronyms. MARACUS is the Mid-Atlantic Regional Association for Coastal Ocean Observing System. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the partners to put on this Hooked on Ocean Acidification program. They include Kirsten Wakefield and Kathleen Davis from Maracuse, also Susanna Music from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and Mike Danko from the New Jersey Sea Grant Consortium. Uh, as I mentioned, I'll be facilitating tonight, but Mike Danko will be the moderator. Uh, two breaks for questions, partway between and at the end. Uh, when you have a question, send it to Mike. Uh, he's labeled as the moderator in the chat feature. Uh, so the schedule for tonight, I'll say some uh, continued welcome introductory remarks, and then I'll turn the controls over shortly to our uh, featured speaker tonight, Dr. Hans Bowman from the University of Connecticut. But hopefully folks, everyone joining us tonight, were also able to join us last week, although we're also recording, we'll be posting this uh, so it'll be a, a living resource for others to follow up on. Uh, I mentioned this program is sponsored by MACAN, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Acidification Network. Um, they are interested in ocean acidification issues from Virginia through Long Island in New York State. Uh, they're a nexus of scientists, uh, federal, state, and tribal agency representatives, resource managers, industry partners, including recreational, commercial fishermen, uh, aquaculture uh, industry um, representatives who coordinate and guide regional observing, research, and modeling of ocean and coastal acidification. Last week, we heard from Dr. Grace Saba about the science informed with, uh, involved with ocean, ocean and coastal acidification. Uh, ACAN is coordinated by Maracuse and another acronym, MARCO, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean. They seek to develop a better understanding of the processes associated with estuarine, coastal, and ocean acidification in the Mid-Atlantic, predict the consequences for our marine resources, and devise local adaptation strategies to better prepare uh, communities and industries um, for issues related to ocean and coastal acidification. Uh, so uh, Kirsten, uh, when she came on for the stakeholder uh, lead for MACAN uh, a few years ago, there was interest, interest in better identifying the uh, stakeholders who were concerned with ocean acidification and what those concerns and issues were. They did a broad stakeholder survey and the, some of the results uh, were discussed last week to help set the stage for this four part mini series. Um, but the recreational fishing industry and stakeholders thereof were quite active in responding to the survey, um, and hence why we uh, created this mini series on ocean acidification. Some of the questions were what are the effects on shellfish and fin fish, uh, the marine food web, uh, what are the time scales and time frames of these issues, uh, and what, how I, these might in fact impact fishing activities, and what could be done to potentially mitigate uh, if an individual angler or citizen, uh, the impacts of ocean acidification. So we just designed this four part mini series um, to um, provide the latest scientific research on ocean acidification in the mid-Atlantic region. As mentioned, Dr. Grace Saba from Rutgers University presented last week on the core science and is helping to set the stage on the impact on some of our fisheries. Tonight we have Hans Bowman speaking about how vulnerable are coastal fishes to ocean acidification. We'll follow up next week uh, with a talks focused in on uh, shellfish and seagrasses and wrap up on Chesapeake Bay water quality um, forecasts and long-term trends uh, in two weeks time on March 11th. So some navigational aids to help us navigate through today's webinar. Um, we are recording each session. You can find those on the news uh, website, webpage, 
of the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Acidification Network. Um, Grace Saba's presentation is already uploaded and we'll continue to do that. Um, please sign in with your first and last name if you haven't done so already, so we can take attendance, record who's here. If you also want to include your home port or where you fish out of most often, that'll be helpful so we can get an idea from where in the Mid-Atlantic and beyond people are joining us. As noted, during Hans' presentations, we'll pause for questions halfway between and again at the end. If you have a question, send it to Mike Danko, the moderator using the chat feature. He'll relay your questions to the speaker uh, at the break and at the end, and hopefully there'll be a great deal of interest tonight. We'll get through as many questions as we can. Uh, we'll wrap up right around the, the talk in the uh, second round of Q&A, hopefully right around 7.50, 7.55. Uh, some wrap up comments and stay on for the end. Uh, those who are participating will be put into a random raffle uh, for an opportunity to win a $25 uh, gift certificate gift card to Bass Pro Shops. So make sure you stick around for the end to be able to uh, potentially uh, win and claim the, the raffle at the end of the night. Uh, so with that, uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, thank and welcome Dr. Hans Bowman for joining us tonight as our featured speaker. Hans is an associate professor of marine science at UConn, University of Connecticut. Uh, he, he's primarily based at the off-campus marine location in Avery Point. He leads the evolutionary fish ecology lab. He's got an uh, undergrad and master's degree from Kiel University in Germany in biology and phys his master's in biology and physical oceanography a PhD in fisheries biology from Hamburg University. He did multiple postdocs, including coming to the US in 2008 at Stony Brook University, uh, and also taught there before migrating to the University of Connecticut. Some of his research interests, hence why we invited him this evening, he's an expert on how fish populations adapt to natural, val natural variability and also human-induced changes, such as warming, ocean acidification, and hypoxia. So Hans, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And I uh, look forward to your talk and appreciate you sharing your knowledge on these topics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug and uh, Kirsten. You're welcome. You're welcome. And, um, give you a moment to grab the controls, but if you share, I mean, stop my share. Oh. Stop my share, my apologies. I stopped my share and now if you wanna go ahead. All right, is this looking like uh, the full screen? Just making sure. Looks great on my end, Hans. Excellent. All right, thanks again. Uh, good evening. It's a real honor and a pleasure to be invited for this mini series. It's a very nice way of uh, getting in touch and uh, spreading the word. Uh, I love to talk about uh, the research that we're doing. And um, I wanna thank you to take some busy time, you know, like out of your, your schedule and uh, settle in in your chairs. I see some very comfortable uh, backgrounds here in the videos. And uh, I hope that you uh, will learn something and that uh, it is something that uh, you find interesting and useful. Here in the background, uh, you can see, I will not uh, lose many more words on this. Uh, I've been in Connecticut since 2014. We do uh, research, we started doing research on small forage fish mostly, but as you can see here in the background, we uh, recently also uh, started some research on uh, black sea bass, which are uh, a bit bigger. We build a, a system in that, uh, in that university that can basically rear these fish and mimic um, conditions as we uh, expect them for future sort of like decades and centuries. So today, what I want to do is uh, uh, basically talk about uh, the, the smallest of these three bubbles. I uh, think for the people who uh, attended last Thursday, Dr. Grace Sava's talk, uh, you may recall that at the end of the day, all three of these things, temperature, uh, the oxygen uh, level, and the level of uh, acidity or the pH levels in our environments are changing simultaneously with uh, anthropogenic, with human-made climate change. And uh, the, the temperature part is because oceans are uh, becoming warmer due to the uh, general uh, warming of our climate. Warmer water holds less oxygen, so we have, uh, we have uh, lower oxygen levels, or we expect lower oxygen levels in the ocean. 
and the continuous dissolution of CO2 in the water uh, drives the pH down. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Saba mentioned this, the ocean is currently not acidic. Uh, our ocean is slightly basic, but since it marches towards acidity, the moniker has been coined ocean acidification. And um, I made these bubbles at some point uh, to illustrate that there is an imbalance of how we are thinking about this. We have been thinking about temperature effects uh, for a long time, and we, uh, we have over 100 years uh, of, of studies on temperature effects on fish. And we also know for quite some time, more than 60 years, we are aware of a problem that, you know, like in some areas, particularly uh, Gulf of Mexico, other areas, uh, hypoxia is a big problem. So considerable research has been devoted on this. And acidification is sort of the new kid in town if you consider about 20 years of empirical research on the effects of acidification on marine organism uh, new. But uh, there's certainly the least empirical uh, data stream here. Uh, what I didn't intend, but what it's just uh, it occurred to me a few days ago is that these bubbles roughly uh, described uh, the take home message uh, for many of you today. And that is, if you take a fish, which is a, you know, like a, a, an ectotherm organism, meaning it cannot regulate its temperature in its body itself, uh, the temperature effects are the most thing. And I will uh, tell you right away before I start to get into the weeds of acidification is that temperature is by far the biggest uh, sort of like factor that um, uh, uh, alters fish physiology and of course also their distribution. Uh, hypoxia comes next and um, even though I might sort of, uh, you know, like I'll not secure the funding that I want to uh, by saying this, but uh, it is something that I want to tell and you know uh, get uh, across right away is that by itself, so if we're talking only of acidification, by itself, uh, ocean acidification is probably for fish at least the, the smallest of all these three factors in terms of how much fish are affected by them. And uh, the flip side sort of that makes this, uh, this statement so qualifying it is that since it occurs in combination often with uh, higher temperature or lower oxygen levels, in combination, it can make things worse. And we will see this in a little bit in some graphs. And uh, the third big point that I want you to take from this today is that although we have amassed quite some data, we have not nearly enough knowledge to really predict what is going to happen a few decades or even centuries from, uh, from now on. We, uh, we do not understand well how populations or ecosystems really uh, react. We, we have some ideas, but it's hard to sort of ground truth that. Okay, with that uh, prelude, I thought what might be an interesting uh, take uh, for all of us today is just to, to tell you a little bit about um, how ocean acidification research on fishes sort of like came about where we are today and where, where things started. And this is not going to be a very long thing. So once upon a time, uh, you can see that the realization of ocean acidification as a problem uh, is more or less two decades old, give or take. So. Uh, Around the, the turn of the century, we uh, as, as, as researchers make uh, that shift from collectively understanding the ocean as a savior for the climate. We, we knew that CO2 is accumulating in the, in the atmosphere, but we always thought like oh, the ocean is uh, basically saving us at least for a little bit because it dissolves all that CO2. Uh, around 20, 25 years ago, we realize that makes the waters more acidic and therefore we might have a problem with all these critters that we will um, hear about next week and you have probably heard about when you are uh, thinking about shellfish, all the critters in the ocean that are making shells of calcium carbonate, they are very sensitive or we are believed to be very sensitive. So immediately the focus uh, was on corals and on shellfish and on uh, little calcareous plankton and so on and so forth. 
But what was not a focus back then were fish, because fish were believed to be resistant to uh, all of these problems. So one last thing to worry about was the attitude about 20 years ago. The reason was not that uh, people didn't like that or didn't want to do it. The reason was simply that um, science believed to have all the data already. Uh, what you can see here is a, an article that eventually came out in 2008, but it very much reflects basically the state of science at the beginning of the century. Um, an article that also influenced me uh, heavily where um, these authors from, uh, uh, from Japan here in that Journal of Marine Ecology Progress Series basically took uh, all the, the knowledge together and first of all, uh, dispensed with the notion that we haven't investigated effects of high CO2 conditions on fish. The reality is that we have done that a lot. Uh, these authors in 2008 were able to find papers going back all the way to the 50s and 60s, where basically high CO2 levels were uh, imposed on fish. The reason is that uh, people were uh, generally interested in uh, an aquaculture problem. If you are putting, if you're cramming a whole load of salmon or tilapia or any other kind of fish into a tank and you're trying to rear them, then you are, uh, then you find that these waters are getting acidified simply by these fish uh, uh, putting CO2 in the water from their metabolism. And so researchers were wondering how, how much CO2 can these fish stand? And because it was aquaculture, it was mainly focused on juvenile and adult fishes. Here you can see on the right hand upper uh, corner, a, a, a pretty typical kind of uh, result for that. This is here on juvenile wolffish, a uh, temperate to subpolar species in the Atlantic, um, where researchers basically like looked at four groups and they reared them for 70 days. And then they looked basically like how much weight did they put on. And as you can see around 480, this is microatmospheres, which is um, also parts per million, roughly equal, equivalent to parts per million. Uh, I will use microatmosphere, but you can also use uh, parts per million instead. And you have to, um, to know more or less that our current atmospheric and in equilibrium ocean CO2 level is around 400. So the 480 here was uh, more or less control current conditions uh, uh, back in those days, a little higher, but back and that was the control. And you can see they went up to 8,000 and then they doubled it again roughly. And then they doubled it again roughly. And only at that very high end, when you reach 26,000 microatmospheres, you are seeing an indeed a, a, a decrease in growth that was mediated by that high CO2. The kicker, however, is that, well, 25,000 microatmospheres in an aquaculture setting is not all that uncommon, but in the ocean, when we talk about ocean acidification, that's something that probably uh, Dr. Saba also mentioned, we are talking about anything that goes between 400 and maybe 2,000 as the average level. When we reach average levels of 2,000 microatmospheres of CO2 in the ocean and in the atmosphere, uh, it would be catastrophic for all kinds of reasons. But fish, particularly juvenile and adult fish, can withstand much, much higher uh, doses than that. And therefore, the conclusion was fish are out of the woods. But this article already basically specified, well, wait a minute, we only have data for juveniles and adults. We never actually like looked at the small fish, the embryos, the little larvae, the developing larvae. So we can't say anything about that because we simply don't have any data. That was the gap uh, that was basically existing and that then researchers took on. So that little green um, stripe that I made here, this is basically the kind of um, area that we consider relevant in our discussion about ocean acidification. You can see this study tested level that were completely irrelevant for our uh, discussion about ocean acidification. And within 
you know, like the first 10,000 or even 20,000 microatmospheres, these uh, fish, when they are juveniles and adults, don't budge. A um, few years forward, some uh, 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 people actually basically took this up and uh, started experimenting not on juvenile and adult fish in the context of aquaculture, but they really looked at levels that were smaller, about like 400, 500, 1,000 microatmospheres. And the uh, pioneering group that was from Australia, in, uh, from the um, James Cook University in, in Townsville, uh, and the uh, uh, east coast of Australia, those were the first who basically started to notice that maybe fish do have a problem uh, they act weird. So around 2006 to, to 2008, a number of studies uh, were done with little tropical reef fish larvae, few days old after hatching, so that picture is not quite correct. The specimens were actually sm smaller than that. And uh, they basically reared these fish under different CO2 levels. And then they had this very sort of nifty contraption where that you can see here on your left side, uh, this is called a Y mace or like a, 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 um, a, a Ramo mace, uh, which is a, a thing that is probably like a foot long, so not very big. It has uh, two uh, tubes feeding wa a water stream in, there's a water flows through it continuously uh, and you can now basically like uh, put different kinds of water in that uh, device. And uh, the researchers basically looked at uh, fish that were swimming or standing, trying to maintain position like fish always do when there is a current. And uh, they recorded basically on what side of that stream the fish were mostly distributed, these little clownfish lines. And one side contained um, some kind of control water, then they switched it around to make sure that everything is sort of like um, really uh, kosher. So one side contained the untreated water and another side contained water where uh, they, they, they took it from a tank that had like a, a predator in it. Not necessarily a barracuda, more like another uh, different kind of predator, but Clownfish larvae and little clownfish are very astute in basically sensing this and getting the hell out of there normally. They also are astute in hearing reef sounds. They also are astute in doing all kinds of other things. But it turns out that if you rear these fish just for a few days under high CO2, they lose that ability. They lose that ability and not only do they not know any more what a predator is and what a non-predator is, they seem to flip around and basically prefer the predator, which is obviously not very good if it's in the wild. So these uh, two graphs that I'm showing here at the top are from uh, a seminal paper from Danielle Dixon in uh, 2010. Danielle Dixon is a professor now at uh, in Delaware, University of Delaware, uh, but she did this on clownfish in Australia. And uh, as you can see here on that control trial, where you basically have fish that uh, were reared under normal conditions, when they are presented with these uh, binary choices, predator versus non-predator, they do what a clever clownfish and normal clownfish is doing and getting the hell out of here, meaning that they are staying on the side of the untreated water and they do not, they, they, they avoid the predator. If you do this with the other group, you can see the picture changes radically. And in that particular experiment, all of those guys were basically like actually doing this, uh, go, going on the, on the wrong side. Uh, we later uh, showed, or our researchers from Australia later showed that uh, if you transplant these little guys from the lab into the reef, the ones that are not having this kind of uh, ability are getting eaten faster, which is uh, no surprise, but it's also an important thing to document. Um, fast forward, there's been lots of uh, studies on this, uh, not just on clownfish, that kind of, um, that, that, uh, that, that, that behavioral anomaly has been 
uh, by now uh, shown in over 80 research papers. Lots and lots of species have been tested about it. Um, but since uh, some people wondered last time um, whether there has been any update or any uh, kind of uh, controversy over this uh, finding, uh, I put this slide in here because uh, just last year a, uh, a paper uh, appeared in Nature, and that's why it got the attention that it got, uh, that purported to uh, replicate these earlier studies, the one that, for example, from Danielle Dixon, and they did not find uh, the same result. And while this is really typical in ocean acidification studies, I myself have made lots of experiments where I expected one thing and found the other, or based on what we saw, we thought would happen, uh, it didn't happen. And uh, this is always a, an opportunity to learn and to ask why not. Uh, the authors in that case, they had some kind of ax to grind uh, with the, the researchers that originally discovered this and uh, basically published a rather, you know, like um, aggressive tone article that uh, suggested that uh, all these other uh, studies have been basically wrong. Um, as it is usual in the, in the literature and the scientific literature, the original authors get uh, basically a, uh, an opportunity to, to respond. And uh, they meticulously basically listed all the different aspects, uh, how that, uh, that original study that purported to mimic the others uh, did not actually um, uh, replicated, but sort of like changed uh, significant details in the course of this. So what to take from it is that uh, no, the, the, the signs of these behavioral anomalies uh, that fish uh, swim in the wrong direction, they can't find the reef, they can't find, smell the predators, they, they learn uh, less and so on and so forth. That is uh, still very much the um, you know, the, 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 not the law of the land, but the paradigm, uh, let's say. And that does not mean that there are uh, examples in the literature where uh, they find the opposite or no effect whatsoever. In fact, uh, the whole field has uh, basically been uh, grappling with that complexity, as I will tell you in a second. All right, going back to our brief history sort of on uh, of, of or a on fishes, so a little later than that, um, it was my sort of uh, a serendipitous turn to make history. We uh, were in Stony Brook on Long Island, and we uh, had some reason, and we had the uh, availability of, of fish lobby to actually test this kind of thing, and uh, we made a, a number of experiments. In this case, here five uh, separate experiments. We contrasted around 400 uh, microatmospheres or parts per million, which you can see here on the x-axis in this, this kind of graph, the different um, symbols and the colors are these different experiments. And if you put all of these things together, you can see that uh, the fish at the control today's level, they survive sort of on average, 50% of them survive the first 10 days after hatch. But the ones that uh, are reared under uh, a thousand microatmospheres, which is something that we, you know, if we are foolish enough to keep burning carbon dioxide the way we are doing it right now, we'll probably reach at the end of this century. So by the year 2100, we could look at basically reduced fish survival. And that reduction is quite uh, dramatic. I can tell you already that this, uh, this was the first time that a direct effect on survival uh, was shown in a fish. I told you that fish are juvenile and adult fish are robust, but these experiments were done with little ones with embryos, newly fertilized embryos. And here, all of a sudden, the story changes quite a bit. Now, what happened uh, afterwards, I never, I, I was a, a postdoc at that time, and um, I never expected basically this um, sort of uh, attention and the, uh, the, uh, sort of, uh, the popular science, which uh, takes a very complicated uh, uh, scientific article title and makes it into a four word uh, article title that is called Acidic Oceans Threaten Fish or 
uh, acid test points to coming fish troubles or something like that. And uh, while I understand the motivation for this, I'm here to tell you today that this is hyperbole. This is not true. Uh, what we are seeing today are effects that are much milder than this initial research paper, my research paper, actually showed. So the notion, I know 10 years ago, that the fish are not okay is something that we already not revise, but we are more cautious in stating. And I show you a, other data in a second that make you, that, that, that show you why I'm saying this. Here, for example, uh, are three different fish species that we at the time uh, were doing research on. The first is a, um, a, a silver, uh, the, the first two are, are silver sides. There is a inshore, like it called inland silver side. Uh, looks very similar to the Atlantic silver side, which uh, you guys probably know as simply bait fish. It is one of the most abundant fish in the mid-Atlantic region and also around Long Island. And uh, we, are, we are doing research still on this particular fish for a whole number of reasons. And um, every time we go to the beach and we are saying uh, we are, we, we are we're catching some of these fish for experiments or other studies, we are often approached by, you know, curious uh, uh, beachgoers or anglers who uh, basically tell us why we're wasting our time catching these guys. And the answer is always because the ones that you want to catch, the flounder and the striper and the, the bluefish, those are the ones that eat silver sides. So these are forage fish. These are important for the ecosystem. If anything happens to those guys, you would feel it uh, one level up for sure. So what are these graphs showing? These graphs are showing basically two, two uh, stressors at once. I talked about oxygen, I talked about um, CO2, and here we combine experiments that have both of these things. Look at the, uh, the, the first graph to your left here, uh, where we have on the y-axis, again, our uh, survival to about 10 days post-hatch. That's what DPH means. 10 days post-hatch in percent. And um, you can see that we have uh, like uh, four sort of different extremes here. We have on the, uh, the, the, the upper, you know, far away corner, we have high pH. High pH means low CO2, means basically today's conditions and very benign um, sort of full saturation oxygen conditions. So this point here in your far, um, away corner is what we consider a control in this environment. And as you can see, if you go uh, along the x-axis with decreasing pH here, you see a decrease in survival. Um, with decrease in oxygen, you see uh, a, a decrease in survival as well. Not as much in this little one, but then it falls kind of off the cliff. And uh, if you then decrease the oxygen to about two and a half, milligram per liter, you, uh, you get basically a survival of zero. Why are we doing this is because we want to find out if uh, oxygen and pH have an effect that is different from simply uh, adding the two effects individually together. And the best illustration is that middle graph here that you can see. You can see a shape that is a trapezoid, and that trapezoid shape is a visual representation of what we call a synergistic effect. A synergistic effect is the same thing when you go, guys go to, the, go to the doctor and the doctor wants to prescribe you a medicine and he asks you what else you are taking because he's worrying that the two drugs together uh, will have an effect that is basically like not existent if you take them just individually. The same thing you can imagine is here. Uh, look at that uh, Atlantic silver side guy, and you see that this guy here, other than the inland silver side, the Atlantic silver side, in this particular experiment, when you go from the uh, left uh, side on the x axis of control conditions to the right side, so high um, CO2, low pH, you see that the survival in this respect doesn't actually budge all that much. It is statistically the same. If you go um, with the y-axis here, you go down, you will see 
that uh, with decreasing oxygen levels, of course, decreasing uh, 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 survival. But now, what happens if you combine these two low oxygen and low pH levels? What you would expect if the two things are basically independent of each other would be some kind of a square shape and we would end up uh, similarly. But the fact that this, this corner here, that corner closest to you is so much lower than the, uh, than the, the, the other one, that is a representation that basically the two stressors together made it worse, have this kind of synergistic effect. And uh, this is one of the chief concerns we have with acidification and, uh, and hypoxia in coastal environments that together they really make it worse. But you can already see on the third uh, panel here, this is a sheep's head minnow, very nice little kind of guy. You can catch those in little, literally ankle deep water and marshes and uh, other near shore environments. And you can see that these guys, you can, you can basically like do whatever you want. These guys, you can have the most extreme conditions and they seem to be completely fine with them. So you can see three different fish species. They all kind of live close to each other in our mid-Atlantic and um, sort of like New England uh, near shore waters. They react very differently to the same set of uh, stress. That being said, we recently discovered a fish species that is actually very sensitive to uh, high CO2 conditions, to low pH conditions. And that's a story that uh, I want to tell you in the second part in a little bit more detail. It's uh, Northern Sandlands. It's called really cool and enigmatic species where uh, particularly embryo stages are very, very sensitive. All right, but now we are basically getting to um, a bulging, a bulging uh, literature here. In the last 10 years, you can say, ocean acidification research, not just on fish, but on all kinds of organisms has exploded as a hyperbole, but it has increased really, really rapidly. So from these early days when, they, when, when we had these first studies saying like, well, there, you know, there is maybe something there and uh, to the studies that showed sort of like, yeah, there, there, there could be an effect. They could uh, basically die under this uh, when they are very, very little. Uh, now a, a, an inflow of concern and inflow also of funding uh, became available to researchers and uh, many, many more studies have been done in the, in the meantime. And what always invariably happens in all of these research fields, when you have a few studies that seem to be showing clear, often very dire sort of implicate very dire effects, you get a lot of interest, a lot of other studies, and the evidence becomes a little bit more blurry, more fuzzy, because one organism is not like the other. There's many, many different kinds of fishes and they react differently, sometimes even closely related fishes, as we see with the inland and the Atlantic silver side, are reacting very differently to these factors. So I uh, put a, a bunch of pictures on here of fishes that uh, we, we have actually like experimented with, not I personally, but sort of as a community. And we can definitely say that these very early life stages, embryos and the little larvae, are uh, CO2 sensitive, um, everything that comes afterwards, we find uh, lots of different types of effects. And uh, you can say they are, they are sensitive, for example, their behavior changes or their growth changes. Here's a little word cloud with you know, a, a good chunk of effects that have basically been shown the, the, the metabolism of the fish changes. But all of these things, are non-lethal changes. They might be problematic for a fish in the wild, maybe getting chased by a predator and when it's more acidic waters, then they, they, they might be basically be uh, easier prey or something like that. But we, we don't know that really um, in, in, a, in a specific example. We know that high CO2 levels in these uh, small, call it early life stages, fish larvae, embryos, 
they change things. They change things in these in these fish. Whether this is all that, that is always changing it for the worse is a. Uh, somewhat in the eye of the beholder and often needs to be demonstrated in a separate way. So first thing I want to uh, show you is uh, some data that a, a good colleague and friend, uh, Steve Binyami, uh, back uh, a few, few years back, did on cobia, not on these beautiful adults that you can see in that picture here, but again, on small cobia larvae. And, uh, what he found and what uh, numerous other colleagues uh, have found over the years and, and confirmed it basically, that that higher level of CO2 triggers a reaction, basically a counter reaction in the bloodstream that ultimately goes into the endolymph of the brain. And in the endolymph of the brain of a fish, there are three pairs of stones, which are called ear stones because that's that's where they are in the fish. They are used for not just for hearing, mostly they are used to orient the fish in the water so that it knows whether it's upside down or, or head first or head up. Um, and these stones are made out of calcium carbonate. And that calcium carbonate is all basically uh, precipitated. These stones are very valuable for uh, ecologists and fishery scientists in general because they often, when you, when you cut them through or you polish them, you can see uh, rings in there and we can study the growth and so on and so forth. In this particular instance, they did not do any of that. They simply measured the volume with a very fine uh, precision tool. They measured the volume of these things and uh, they find that when you do, uh, when you rear fish in the higher CO2, they react, their, their physiology and their blood reacts, they specifically make uh, a, a thing called bicarbonates that basically buffer that higher CO2 and that higher bicarbonate ultimately um, translates into bigger otoliths. That graph here on the left where you can see data for two different ones. The biggest one is often the Sagitta, it's called, the, the smaller one is called Lapidilis. Um, both of them are showing the same thing. If you read these fish under about 2,000 microatmospheres, they are making bigger, heavier ear stones. And uh, it might be a problem, but uh, we don't know. We really haven't actually had a test where these fish were shown to hear worse or, 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 or do any other thing uh, with this. We only know it happens, and it happens in almost all fish species that have been um, looked at so far. Uh, here's a guy that uh, some of you uh, definitely recognize, Summer Flounder. Again, we do have some data on Summer Flounder, thanks to our good colleagues in New Jersey from the Sandy Hook um, Laboratory, a NOAA laboratory where uh, ocean acidification research on fish is uh, being done and, and uh, very consistently done in that, uh, in that governmental lab. Uh, Chris Chambers is the um, a researcher, the, the head researcher there. And uh, they pretty early on uh, looked at uh, summer flounder for the same reason that you guys are here because they are important recreational and commercial fishes. Turns out summer flounder are indeed uh, sensitive to high CO2. You can see here, of course, the fish that I'm showing in the background is a, a beautiful adult swimming probably in aquarium. Uh, the fish that the, the experiment was done was summer flounder, but these very small early stages when a flounder is still a fish that has eyes on both sides of its head. You remember probably that uh, flounders, flat fishes are the only vertebrates really that uh, become basically like asymmetrical at uh, an early point of time. Before that happens, before they actually like go onto the ground, that's uh, when they looked at their sensitivity and uh, the fact that this red line goes down basically tells you that their survival relative to the controls uh, went down by half here in that intermediate level. And if you do a very high level, then uh, it's probably only a quarter of uh, the control. So strong effect, uh, but you can see uh, here that high level with that almost 5,000 microatmospheres might not be realistic. Experimenters have only have often basically uh, the, the problem that they want to show an effect, but 
um, in order to, to, to show an effect, they need to have uh, a more extreme kind of uh, treatment. So summer flounder are, are um, sensitive uh, here and in a you know, handful of other fish species, uh, the researchers looked at uh, sections. Here you can see stained microscopy, so-called histology sections, where the big bubble in the middle is the eye that is basically like cut through with a very, very uh, sharp and thin microtome knife. And then it's put on a glass slide and you can see those black uh, lines here, which are the uh, photoreceptors of the eye. Um, what uh, they find, and this is really something where even I have uh, sometimes problems to follow them, they look at these tiny little sort of uh, air bubbles here or, or, or vacuoles that they identify, uh, you know, predominantly in these high CO2 fishes. Um, again, whether this is actually a problem, this, they call it a tissue damage, um, whether this tissue damage is, is actually a problem, whether these fish maybe do fine with it and get over it, or whether they all die, is uh, something that has yet to be demonstrated. But it's an effect of high CO2. Um, and last but not least, just as a little potpourri, I, I wanted to uh, highlight some of the studies that um, feature uh, not clownfish from a tropical reef, but fish that you know our community here is uh, interested in. We do have some data, uh, thanks to uh, the uh, Tim Target, a professor in um, uh, University of Delaware, that uh, looked at juvenile weak fish. Uh, when they are small, they are, of course, very close to the shore. They are also very used, very adapted to very uh, high and low uh, pH and oxygen conditions. And indeed, uh, this is a uh, a, a simplified graph that I made from uh, a paper that appeared in 2017. They basically like reared these fish for uh, a bunch of days. They looked how much mass that they put on. And um, even though that red line is below the blue line, if you see how fast it basically like grows, how fast it goes up, there is literally no difference. Uh, weak fish are very, very uh, tolerant, not just to high CO2, but also to um, lower oxygen conditions and uh, are probably, for that reason, um, also uh, abundant in our near shore areas. Uh, last but not least, here are our silver sites again, these little bait fish that you uh, guys uh, you know, used to catch all kinds of other uh, bigger piscivorous fishes. Um, uh, we are doing lots of uh, interesting experiments with them. We, for example, reared these fish not just for a few days. We wanted to, sh to show when you start these experiments and rear them for maybe a third of their life or half of their life or even their whole life, is there maybe some difference? We, we know that if you take them from the wild as adults, they, they are not interested in CO2, they are tolerant. But if you do this in the laboratory from the beginning, basically all their life, this graph here shows you some work uh, that we published recently uh, at last year where we reared really thousands of fish and you can then uh, look at the distributions and you see that indeed the difference is very small, but there is a difference on the high CO2, uh, these fish on average grow up um, shorter. Uh, they're, 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 they're growing slower. And uh, this is uh, data that we are uh, just basically like uh, trying to publish just in review. Here we uh, reared fish under high CO2 for all their life. And then we look basically at the amount of eggs that they are making, the females. And uh, you can see here uh, under uh, controlled CO2 conditions, they make, uh, this is times thousand, they make about like on average like 400, um, eggs for, for every gram of the female. And then when you go to the high CO2 conditions, they make significantly less. So maybe some of the energy that they need to expend all their life for regulating against that high CO2 leaves them with less gas in the tank to actually make eggs. This would actually be a concerning finding, but we 
need to, that's just the first of its kind and it needs to be um, basically uh, affirmed by follow-up uh, studies. All right, so I'm basically, I, I want to make a break here. I uh, want to give you a, a chance to say like, wait a minute, I didn't understand this. Can you explain this again or have other questions? And uh, then I want to basically launch into a, a case study that is a little bit more extensive on Sam. So I'll give the word back to Doug or to Mike, and we have a little question and answer. Yeah, I got it here. Uh, thank you very much, Hans. That was a great overview so far of different trophic levels from the bait fish up to the larger animals, summer flounder and weak fish, and uh, really excellent. We have a couple of questions in queue, but I'll turn it over to Mike moderating. If folks have other, any other questions, let us know now. Uh, we'll hopefully get to on this break. Yeah, thank you, Doug, and thank you, Hans. Uh, we do have a couple questions. Uh, the first one was from uh, Christine Moran, and, and she was wondering why um, clownfish also use light um, to sight or avoid predators, or do they primarily rely on scent? Yeah, clownfish, uh, they use light like also minnows and all other, uh, like many other fish have a incredible chemical uh, sensation. So if one of, if one of their uh, peers is getting eaten or is getting chased, the, 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 the chemical substance that they release is being picked up around uh, the, the reef and everybody else is going into hiding. I believe their chemical sense is much stronger than their actual uh, you know, sense of, of visual acuity. That being said, you know, if you as a diver, you know, basically like dive over a reef and you're casting a big shadow, then they would, they would pick up on that and they would also um, uh, you know, like jump into their uh, anemones or in their uh, coral uh, sort of like crevices. Um, I'm not aware that CO2 has been shown to alter this kind of like big shadow comes in front of the aquarium and the fish behave differently. Thank you, Hans. Uh, we have one more question, and this is in um, relation to the study you did with the silver sides and the sheep's head minnow. And the, the question is, um, I want to know how did you factor in the size of the Atlantic and inland silver size compared to the size of a sheep's head minnows and how else did you factor in uh, considering their their habitats are so different? Ah, well, um, we basically started with tiny eggs, fertilized eggs, newly fertilized eggs uh, in both of in all of these species and we reared them to hatch and then uh, to about 10 days post hatch. So when they're still very, very small, uh, probably like, you know, half an inch uh, small. And at that time, you can't tell any differences in size uh, between an Atlantic and a, um, a, an inland silver size. I could have shown you a picture of one or the other and, uh, and, uh, and told you what they are. Uh, they are they're virtually indistinguishable at that point. Even as adults, it's, uh, it can be hard to uh, distinguish the inland silver side from an Atlantic silver side. The Atlantic silver sites are getting bigger. They are usually found in more high salinity waters, like the name inland silver side implies. Uh, these are uh, fish that can also live in fresh water. They can also, they, they, they live in brackish water, but they tend not to like full strength salinity. Uh, so much. So uh, these are these are differences. And as the, uh, you know, the, the as your question basically implies, you are actually like um, putting your nose at a uh, at, at one of these you know like unresolved or lots of these unresolved uh, differences. Yes, these fish are closely related. They live a little bit different places. Is that is that basically the reason why they are differently susceptible? Um, I don't know, but it's a it's a good it's a good question that has to be answered. I don't know the answer to that. I believe that the 
more extreme the environment is that these fish are naturally living in, the more tolerant they are. And you can see this uh, sheepset minnows, for some reason, they are, um, they are way more, way more tolerant against all kinds of not just CO2 and oxygen, but also against temperature stress. And the reason is, is that they live in these very, very sort of like shallow near shore areas. It's probably when you go to the beach at some point and you just dash into the water with your kids. And by the time you are basically ankle deep in the surf, you see some fish sort of like um, moving all away. That's when, um, that's, that's, that's the environment that sheep set minnows see. And it can be extremely hot. It can be extremely uh, oxygen poor at some point in, in some other areas where you don't have like turbulent mixing. And it can be very acidic too. And uh, it seems that this kind of uh, environment they are adapted to makes them very, very resistant to anything that you throw at them in terms of uh, ocean acidification. Thank you, Hans. And we had a, one more question come in. Uh, I think we have uh, time for one more. Uh, and this was regard to the, um, the otolith response that you saw um, performed in the lab. And just wanted to, uh, the question was, would you expect to see some changes in volume in the field or is the pH too variable in the inshore habitats, in ha habitats to um, pick up those changes? Yeah, I want to talk about this in a little bit uh, later because this honestly is sort of like the stage we are in right now where we are trying to make sense of how different different fish species are and why some fish species are sensitive and others are not. And I believe that uh, you have the right intuition here and it is that in these near shore, in these coastal environments that's mostly where you guys uh, are fishing, we have organisms that are seeing uh, swings, daily swings, tidal swings in both pH and oxygen. And in order to live there, they have to be very, very tolerant. So um, we, we are coming to a realization and that's why I also said what I said at the very beginning is if we look at coastal marine fishes that live in these highly variable areas, um, increasing the CO2 by a little is probably not going to be a big, dent, a big negative effect. When it gets complicated, and I believe where we should worry is when the swings are getting larger and larger, that's something that is being predicted, and uh, when, they, when they are basically like very far outside the control, but that's not going to happen in our life. Okay, thank you, Hans. We appreciate that. Uh, we'll also keep that in question in mind as we move through the rest of the presentation. Uh, just before I turn it back to you, I just wanted to remind everybody: if you do have questions, feel free to send them to me in the chat, and I'll um, keep track of them and try and get as many as we can in at the. Um, where we end this evening's presentation. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Hans. All right. Hans, so, before, um, we, before you continue, just real quickly, a heads up, I'm monitoring the time. Uh, yeah. We have 7.32, so if we can get to the remainder of your slides in about 20 minutes or a slight or so. Yeah, yeah let's, uh, let's do that. I'm sorry that I'm uh, talking. No problem. You've covered a lot of great ground already. So uh, I, I expect, uh, expect the unexpected is sort of the uh, there's a big overtone here and I want to show you this graph to make you aware of where we are. We have about 20,000 marine fish species uh, in the world. We have tested about 60 of them. At that pace, we will not uh, basically like be able to test even, you know, a large enough chunk to, to say something about uh, anything really here. Uh, that's about a 0.3% of all these fish species. We have to uh, find a way to synthesize information. There's no, no debate that we need more studies and more data on this, but we, we can't ever hope to basically test everybody. It's impossible. 
instead we need to as, as scientists we need to become a little bit more creative and see like basically like how can we uh, solidify or how can we think about our data a little bit more comprehensively here you can see a similar more local uh, representation uh, thanks uh, uh, to Doug for, for sharing, Kirsten to, for sharing uh, this slide with me uh, that's particularly the sort of like most popular uh, recreational fish species here you can see black sea bass and scuff and you can see John hog and bluefish and weak fish and I can tell you of all of these uh, important, uh, uh, recreationally important fishes, uh, we have some kind of data about their sensitivity uh, for two. Everybody else, uh, we, we don't know. We, we really have no empirical data on their particular sensitivity. There, there, there are many reasons for that. Uh, not every fish species is really a good thing to bring into the lab. It's not all that easy to just say like, well, I did it on server sites, let me try bluefish next. It's actually uh, a bit more complicated to just switch uh, between species. As I told you, we are trying to look at uh, black sea bass uh, next in our lab. But so the data situation when you're wondering, so what is of all these fishes that I'm interested in, we have some kind of data for two. And um, the other thing that really is uh, really a, a perfect word, the, the last question was a perfect segue and the question before too, is when we talk about ocean acidification and coastal waters, it's probably a wrong way to talk about that problem. I wanna illustrate this here by uh, saying, well, the average open ocean CO2 conditions that we are, uh, this graph is from 2015, as you can see, it's about that right now, a little more than 400 actually already. But um, we predict that in the business as usual scenario, we could reach in about 300 years, we could reach these 2,000 parts per million average open ocean CO2 levels. And here is a graph on the same scale, about 50 hours in a temperate uh, tidal salt marsh. Uh, here, this is the Flax Pond salt marsh in. Um, on the north shore of Long Island, you can see here that um, in summer, when the uh, when the, the tide goes out and when the, the daylight fades, uh, here at sunset we have about 550 uh, parts per million, a little higher than the open ocean. But then, uh, because the respiration at night, there's no more photosynthesis in the water, respiration at night, and then you can see levels are climbing within a few hours uh, to more than twice what we predict to come in the next 300 years in the ocean. So let me let that sink in. The organisms who are living in a near shore tidal marsh experiencing twice the variability that is predicted for the next 300 years in the open ocean. And that already tells you that organisms that live in these marshes, for example, our server sites, necessarily must have some kind of ability and are probably the winner in all of this. Um, that being said, when we kind of realized that, that conundrum that we are actually talking about coastal acidification or coastal processes um, that are much more depending on the, uh, the, the how, how the animals are basically respire and the plants are photosynthesizing, then that's, that's when we tried, we really specifically tried to imagine a fish species that might be different. And we came, you know, up with, you know, there's lots of serendipity involved, but here we came up with basically uh, this uh, northern sandlands, a species that is uh, also goes down all the way to New Jersey, that's sort of its southern limit, but goes up all the way to Greenland. Uh, this particular study was done on uh, Stellwagen Bank. Some of you might have had the uh, privilege of joining one or two of these uh, enigmatic whale watching trips that are uh, going out from all over the Cape and even from Boston to Stellwagen Bank because humpback whales, right whales, all kinds of other whales, but also tuna and then lots of seabirds are in this National Marine Sanctuary. 
And uh, the reason for almost all of these things to be there is sandlands. Sandlands is the forage fish that birds and even humpback whales are eating. And uh, here you can see basically my, my PhD student back then, now uh, a doctor uh, pushing the trawl net. Here is the Stellwagen Bank. It's a, it's a, it's a very charismatic uh, environment underwater because it has very clean core sand. This is actually the sand that we brought with us into the lab to uh, keep these fish for a while before we uh, wanted to spawn them and then do experiments on their actual um, uh, offspring. And uh, what we found was surprising, really surprising to us, even though we, we kind of wanted uh, to, to, to show that, but a, a huge difference. So when they, when they are reared at five degrees Celsius and these 2000 uh, microatmospheres, their, 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 their survival to uh, the amount of hatching uh, basically craters uh, in, a, in, a, in an incredible fashion. And at a higher temperature, if you combine this with higher temperature, you get a, a very, very low survival. Well, one experiment could be a fluke. We tried to do this again. And here's a, um, a second and then a third year that we, are, that we do. And basically, uh, these graphs show you that uh, these, these, uh, these sandlands, they, they spawn in winter. They're winter spawners. They develop slowly. And only after sort of uh, seven or five weeks, they start to hatch in uh, five degrees Celsius. But um, you can see the blue line goes up much higher. That's the control eventually reaches about 70% of the uh, fish that hatch, whereas under the 2000, 1000, 2000, the, um, the, the, the survival to hatch is very much lower. Um, Repetition is very important in our business and our science. And we can say now that this is a robust pattern. Sandlands are very sensitive when they are embryos in the egg to high CO2 conditions. And that is the, um, the point of all of this is to make a contrast. Science lives for contrast and learns from contrasts. So we have our silver side on the left side, which is a near shore fish. That, that is in, in marshes, you, you, you see them, you can catch them with a beach sand. It is spawning in spring and summer when the water is warming up and becoming all kinds of crazy with the pH and, uh, and, and, and uh, fluctuations. And it develops very fast, relatively fast. In five, day, in five days, you go from a fertilized egg to a hatching fish. I told you sand plants are not like that at all. They, uh, they, they take sometimes seven weeks to hatch. In, in our latest experiment, it was even later. They're winter spawners, but crucially, they are on these like offshore uh, banks where you have to drive out with a boat, where you have to go after them, and where the CO2 levels are much, much more stable. We actually looked at this and measured this, and you see um, the silver side, the blue line. Look at that blue line um, that basically like seasonally, but also within each day, wiggles dramatically up and down. And uh, this is what a silver side basically sees. Look at what a sand land sees when it's in the water column, um, basically stable pH conditions. This is what these guys are adapted to. They're, that's where they live. That's where they're adapted to. And um, we learn from this, basically, sand lands in the embryo stage very, very sensitive. Here's a, basically the bar shows you how sensitive they are. The sand lands have a, what we call a, a higher effect size. It's basically they're negatively, both of these fish uh, species are overall negatively affected, but sand lands you can see is much, much more sensitive, much more negatively affected than that silver side. And we believe this is because of where they live and the habitats that they are actually um, adapted to. And um, I'll basically like sort of like end with this. This leads us to believe that if we want to focus or we want to know the fish species that we should test next, that we should really try to learn, we should actually not uh, sort of like willy nilly go and test whatever fish species we catch next in our beach sign, but we should be more strategic and um, 
these nearshore environments that is sort of symbolized here by that sine wave, they have that huge variability day to day, but also from one season, from winter to summer in uh, CO2 conditions. I showed you one example of that salt marsh. And those, and those uh, critters are likely the least sensitive. And the good news is that most of the fish that you actually encounter if you don't go sort of like open ocean fishing off the shelf. And uh, as you go further out in the shelves, these uh, daily and seasonal wiggles, fluctuations become less and less prominent and the uh, effect of high CO2 becomes more and more. So you want to find a fish species that is really sensitive. First of all, you have to find one that develops slowly and then another and then is basically like developing in a stable ocean habitat. Not the shore, not the coast environments that most of the fish that you are interested in as a fisherman uh, are actually like living. All right, and uh, with that being said, we have so far basically talked about experiments where we mimic the future ocean in about, you know, like 100 years or 200 years or 50 years. And um, that's an important first step, but we have other steps to take as scientists and not all these steps are very easy because uh, we need to basically find out, okay, that one particular fish species might be negatively affected like our sandlands, but what if it gets more food because the copper poles are doing just fine or can these fish adapt to it? We believe that most fish species, particularly those that have very short generation times, have somewhat the ability to adapt their way out of this, but um, we don't know for sure. And uh, we really don't uh, know, we are not able to predict really uh, specifically how certain ecosystems like Chesapeake Bay or like uh, the New Jersey shore uh, will basically uh, react to uh, future acidification. We're simply not there yet. And uh, yeah, this is my last slide. I always uh, uh, try to tell people basically like, uh, let's stay clear of three, and I call them straw men because I'm gonna beat them to death. Um, let's stay clear of those because let's stay clear of the people who basically take away from what I said and say like, well, then there's nothing to worry about. The truth is there is something to worry about. These things will have some effect. They will have some effect in combination, probably something that we don't even have on our radar right now as I said, expect the unexpected. So there is reason to worry, but as I tried to make clear with these headlines of these popular science articles in response to my own paper, um, the notion that we are sailing into doom here because of ocean acidification is not true. It's not true that all is lost. This kind of uh, hyperbole is, uh, mis is not called for, at least when it comes to ocean acidification. And then there are people in the science community who say like, well, it's also difficult to find out and we don't know this about this. So maybe it's just impossible. And uh, to those people, I also tell that it's uh, uh, too cynical. We do have some tools, we can make progress. And some of that progress I showed you today. And with that, I'll uh, show you uh, our lab back in the free COVID times. And if you uh, want to be interested more, uh, here's the website. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Hans. That was a great uh, presentation, very informative. Uh, we do have a, a couple questions. Um, the first one comes from Kate, and she was wondering if there was any uh, testing that's been done with uh, pelagics, such as sharks, tuna. Yes, uh, tuna have been on the radar uh, for obviously also probably the reason that uh, you're asking the question. Uh, we have some data about yellowfin tuna. Yellowfin tuna are extremely fast developing. As you perhaps know, uh, a tuna uh, uh, hatches out of the egg and is about three or four millimeter long. And by the time they are reaching eight or nine millimeter, they start eating fish, other fish. So, and then they're, 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 they're growing up, of course, in warmer environments like Gulf of Mexico, where they, where they spawn. And they're extremely fast growing. And uh, the studies that I know of uh, that were done in Panama uh, and they did this, they found no 
measurable effect. Also dolphin fish. And um, I don't really know what the, uh, the, the common name for CRIO is. But um, another sort of like fast pelagic, fast born pelagic fish in the tropics, those fish seem to be fine. They, they grow too fast. By the time uh, CO2 can have any effect, they're long uh, out of the woods. They are too strong swimmers and too fast developers to uh, be affected, at least in these relatively simplistic uh, experiments where you put the high CO2 and you measure the survival of any effect. Thank you, Hans. I think we have uh, time just for one more question and a, and a relatively uh, short answer. Um, the question would be, comes from, uh, from Doug, and he was curious if any um, stock assessment scientists or fishery managers have been considering the impacts of ocean acidification um, and then there's the second part would be um, perhaps uh, consider how it might impact recruitment issues or predator prey interactions. And answer, I'm sorry, remind you, we only have a couple minutes. So. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, the answer is short because the answer is no. We, um, we, we, we do not know, we are not assigned as to the science is not confident enough yet in our predictions that um, NOAA fisheries managers would uh, basically incorporate those information and make predictions and, and, and plan out the next years for them. So uh, the answer is, is simple, is no. And um, there have been some kind of back of the envelope attempts of calculations of cod, for example, uh, in, uh, in Norway, where it was projected that in 50 years, only a third of the fish would basically recruit, uh, would basically grow up. But uh, I was one of the reviewers of uh, this uh, manuscript who said that this is um, not called for. That is, a, that is, again, one of these sort of like uh, headline grabbing um, uh, sort of like conclusions that are not actually true and um, that we should take with a grain of salt. And I want to tell you, as, as fishermen, when you go out fishing and you have in your life seen changes, uh, the changes that you've seen probably come from the steadily warming ocean and the shifting distribution. You are, you're catching things that you haven't caught before. At least people in Long Island Sound are, are, are doing that. Uh, so this is temperature. The temperature really makes species to go on the move. They, it, it, it affects them in many ways. And acidification might be that little thing on top of it that makes things certainly not better, but in many cases, it's hard to uh, measure that, that how much worse it's going to get. So it's not important. That was great. Thank you, Hans. And uh, just wanted to thank you. I really appreciate you coming out tonight and uh, taking the time out to make your presentation with us. We appreciate that. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to uh, 